legend never dies. And a good story won't stay buried for long. The Phantom Cuda is back. Coming to get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. Joined by his out of this world cousin Dougie. Oh, hi, Mark. His apprentice and daughter, Alyssa. Whoa, whoa, stop. And his childhood best friend, Royal. Mark hates everybody. His protege painter, Will Scott. You got one job. This is Graveyard Cars. This is exciting. The gentleman who we finished restoring the Phantom Cuda for called me out of the blue. So he felt like he's enjoyed the car, he's had a blast with it, but he wanted to move on to a different style of car. So he asked me if I knew anybody that might possibly be interested in the Phantom Cuda. It's actually kind of cool the car has come back and outside of, you know, a polish, a detail, they use this car as like a daily driver almost, so that's actually even better. The car got used. I was thinking to myself, this could be the perfect car for the guy that bought our 70 Cuda EV2 Tour Red, the loaded 340 car that one of my former employees sabotaged the engine on, you guys probably remember that. He bought the 340 car from us, absolutely loves the car, calls it Cuda Ta. He said that if another Cuda ever came up, that he would like to know about it. Sent him some photos, some information, he was absolutely in love. So the reason that car is here right now is so that we can go back through it, make a few changes to it that the new owner wants, and make sure it's exactly as it was delivered when we had the big reveal in Graveyard Car several seasons ago. Then, it's on its way home to Switzerland. Car looks great, it's held up remarkable, so it is a pat on your back to not only myself, but my guys to say, you know, all that work we were putting in five years ago, look at it now, even though I know like half those guys are gone now, but I guess it is just me. Yeah, so I, yeah, it's a credit to myself right now. This is the car that really ignited my idea for graveyard cars. I was there literally at the birth and thought of graveyard cars and what it was gonna to take to repair this car. So when I say this is the car that started graveyard cars, here's why. Unbeknownst to me, this car had toured all over the country during the previous summer at all the big events. Everybody who was in the Mopar world knew about that car. And so when I posted that we were restoring it, the first things that come out, the word was we were gonna rebody the car. The car could not be restored. It was physically impossible. They had seen the car in person. It could not be restored. They were gonna cut the numbers out of it and put it in a nice body and call it a real car. We don't do that. That's against the law. If a car is gone, it's gone. This car could be saved. So I decided I wanted to document it. When I decided I wanted to document it, I had a young fella come over here, Aaron Smith. Aaron came over and he filmed some of the pulls on the car and he worked with Darren and myself. And at the end of the first day, he said, you guys are hilarious. You're absolutely a riot. You crack me up. You should have your own show. And long story short, those were the wrong words to say to Mark G. Warman. We had to get the car completely disassembled, make our pulls on it. If you watch back in the, I think it was a pilot episode, you saw that we made the critical pulls to get the quarter panel out, the rear body panel, frame rails, the right hand quarter, the door opening squared up, the nose pulled around and squared. All that needed to be done before we sent it out and had it dipped. But once it was, we took it to Portland, the company was up there at the time that we were using, they did a complete chemical bath of the car, stripping everything off of it so we could see it in its original birthday suit. Once the car had came back from the dipper all cleaned up, it was just a matter of us taking a look at what could be saved, what needed to be replaced, and what parts and pieces we wanted to do it with. Uh, at that time, I had reached out to Mike at AMD. I was telling Mike about it, and he said, let me talk to Craig over at the installation center. Maybe we can do you a solid. And they did. 
And so they had me pallet that thing up on a big pallet, send it back to Georgia to their installation center. Craig, with his crack shot team of guys and equipment, rebuilt that car completely for us. So the next time we saw the car come back, it was ready to do mud work on it. I mean, they had literally aligned all the panels on it. There was a bit where uh, Craig had showed me the striker for the driver's door jam. When we sent the car out and had it dipped, that striker was in place. So the paint underneath it didn't get stripped off. He used that original door opening, that original jam and rocker. When it came back, he was able to pull that striker out and show me the original footprint of the paint and that it was setting on the original footprint of the paint and the door opened and closed like it was supposed to. You'd basically tore a car down to absolutely nothing but grains of salt on the ground, built it back up again, and had a pin go right through the hole you always wanted it to. That was perfection. And that was the step that we needed to be able to move forward to where we are today. You know, doing the paint work on it, EV2 Hemi Orange is just, it's an easy color. There's no stress. But the buildup, because everybody wants to see it, because this car was in the pilot, you go back in to check on it, make sure that everything still looks good. You got a fly that lands in the roof. What are the chances of that? Will started with me many years ago, over 20 years ago. He was a young kid, out of, fresh out of high school. He was a spooner, somebody whose parents kind of hand him everything on a silver platter. They're wonderful people, the salt of the earth, Denise and Larry. So I had to take him under my wing. He didn't teach me. The most help that I ever got was working underneath four crappy painters. So being a prepper for like five years, I learned what not to do. Mark doesn't have time to come out and help. This car was one that I took him under my wing the most on. Everybody was watching on this one. The world was watching. So he raised himself up to that challenge, and he nailed it perfectly. I was able to get the cut and buff done. Car looks amazing. After that, take it outside, get it washed, get all the undercoating done. That way I can kick it right over to assembly and get this thing built. Uh, but Mark wants you to talk about how much thinner you were. You know it isn't coming from me. <laughs> All right, so I'm up a few pounds. I play Santa year-round. And what's my daughter going to think if Santa rolls in and it looks like he could hang glide with the Dorito? Yes, I put on 38 pounds for that reason. I provide happiness to children on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Me and this was one of the first 71 Kudas that got a billboard on it. Now, it wasn't a factory billboard. We added the billboard to it for looks. That's what the owner wanted us to do at the time. I thought it was an opportunity to let Will and Alyssa learn how to do what they just scoff at when they walk by. Will said, how hard could it be? Well, I gave them the opportunity to find out how hard it could be. Can we pull it off the other way? <laughs> how dirty are your hands? Look at that. Did you wash them? Yes. Two valuable billboards in a row. First one, they didn't even get off the table. But because I knew that was coming, our friends down at Phoenix Graphics sent me three sets. Patience is the name of the game in this. You know, it is what it is. I messed it up. I was just learning. And on top of which, Will sabotaged me again. He never had any plans on us actually getting the billboard on it. While we did screw it up, I mean, that part was on us. The nice thing is it was so epic of a fail, he's never asked me to do it again. So while I do joke around a lot and I like to have fun, sometimes it seems like I'm not very serious. When it comes to our skill sets here and what I have the ability to do, I take it very seriously. I'm proud to be where I'm at, that I can do it, but I'm more proud of all of the people, the employees, the vendors, subcontractors that allow this car to come back to life and have a brand new shot at the title, as Rocky would say. After I had bought the car from the guy, he had told me that he found the original steering wheel. He knew he had it. He couldn't find it at the time he delivered the car, so later, he brought that steering wheel up to me and I thought, I've got to put that steering wheel back on the car. Kind of like with Kimberly Cook's 1970 Barracuda, that was the steering wheel her dad had his hands on and steered all the time of his life. So while so many parts were new and so much was replaced on the car, here we were able to put the original steering wheel that was on that car when it went head over heels on that highway so many years ago. And then to be able to unveil that car to the new owners with some of the team that helped make that car happen. We're going to reveal. Are you ready? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Four, three, two, one. 71 Cuda. Let's go. There you go. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it was a great day because it allowed me to put closure to the car. The best vendors, the best employees, treat them all right, pay them well. 
And at the end of the day, you'll end up doing things that the rest of the world can't do. So when I'm able to take a car from what it was and can build this car back up and give it a brand new life, which we are doing right now, the caretaker who got it from us when we first finished with it has memories with that car that it, nobody ever would have had. Now it's going to Switzerland, so it's going to create all new memories over there. The gentleman who bought the car in Switzerland just asked that I look the car over and make sure that it's in the same shape and condition that it was in when we unveiled it on Graveyard Cars five years ago. One thing that jumps out at me is maybe it left here this way, but you see how high the peg and the pin is here for the hood pins. That should be down more. That pin should be down in the saddle more. So this literally is just barely touching the escutcheon when it goes on. But the Plymouth emblem still looks fantastic. The bezels look great. Might do a little polish on the bezel, but for the most part, that looks fantastic. Just needs a little adjusting. Shaker is still in great shape. The emblems still have the same shine, the same depth. Again, when you're buying parts, you can buy parts from anybody, but if you're buying from companies like we do, you're guaranteed that you're gonna have a good quality part years down the road. Not just a part, but a good quality part on there. Quick note, I like to do little tutorials. See that the shaker is black. If you have a 1970 Cuda with an N96 shaker hood, you had argent silver. That's the way it was, that was the color. In 71, they said they want that bubble black. I believe it was because of shine, not because of looks. I think it was because of the amount of sun that would reflect off of the silver was a little bit blinding. It's the same reason that the blackout sport treatments on these hoods are always a matte black. They don't want to reflect that light. They went to this matte black shaker bubble. But to throw you one more curveball in case anybody's wondering, in 1970 to 1971, if you had an N96 Cuda, you got the Argent in 70, you got the Black in 71. But in 70, if you bought an FE5 red 70 Cuda, the bubble was red, the mirrors were red, and if you ordered rubber bumpers, they were red. The whole car was color keyed, and it's the only color that you could have got something besides the Argent in 70. In 71, you didn't even get that option, you got black. So just kind of looking over the car, looking at the shine, wheel openings have had no rash on them. Beauty rings look great. It does, it looks like the day we delivered it. Usually by now you get some scuffs on things. I mean, they're cars, right? We drive them. Louvers, get these from Tony's Mopar Parts. Look at the chrome, still as shiny as the day it was. I know people at home saying, so what, it's only been five years, yeah? Go look at some five-year-old restorations that are for sale on eBay right now. Maybe they weren't that great when they were new anyway. Chrome mirrors, beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. Look at the shine of the chrome and the depth of it, just like it was brand new. My little fingerprints off of there. Probably wondering about that. It's the greatest guitarist that ever lived, so. It gives you haters something to do on Facebook and go in there and say, he wasn't the greatest, so-and-so was great. No, he was pretty much the greatest. Billboards still have the same matte finish. This is a little tricky because it's easy to be waxed in the car and hit that billboard and give it a little shiny spot. There's no shiny spots on it. Rear wheel, center cap, wheel opening molding, no damage, rocker molding. Blackout still looks great. Not a parking lot ding, no rash. Keep in mind, this black side marker bezel is correct when you have a black billboard. If it was a white billboard, which is the only other choice you would have had on a billboard, that bezel would be white to match that. In fact, interestingly enough, the actual bezels themselves had the word white and black etched into them from the factory. They had black ones, white ones, and then paint to match ones on the assembly line. In a previous season of Graveyard Cars, we restored this gorgeous 1968 Dodge Charger RT 440 Magnum Automatic. Paint code MM1. What did Dodge call MM1 in 1968? Was it turbine bronze metallic, dark tan, burnt orange? If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. All right, folks, how did you do on that one? 
What did Dodge call the MM1 paint coat in 1968? If you said burnt orange, you were incorrect. While it is my favorite color, that was a 1970 color. The correct name is Turbine Bronze Metallic. Just for the record, T7 is dark tan, also available in 69 and not in 68. In addition to that, this car featured a pearl white bucket seat interior, 440 Magnum engine, rally instrument cluster, and a white bumblebee stripe. Let's talk about the grill area here. This car is not coated for the road lamps, L34. The owners that bought the car originally five years ago for me wanted me to add those. I think it's a great add. I think it looks fantastic. And the new owner who's in Switzerland wanted to add chin spoilers to it amongst a couple of other things and we'll show you those in a minute. It also could have come with chin spoilers but didn't come with chin spoilers. So there are some modifications over the fender tag in addition to the earlier modifications that we did back when we were delivering the car to the folks in North Carolina that bought it. One of the things that blew up on the internet back then after the car was done, after it aired on TV, was the grill. This car is EV2 Tour Red. That's the paint code for it. You'll see the grill is an argent silver grill. According to the parts manual, as well as the data book, there were nine colors that if you got a 71 Cuda, not a Barracuda, 71 Cuda BS model, and you picked one of these nine colors, you would get a color keyed grill. Not the bumper, that still was an option too for Elastomeric, but your grill would be the same color as your body. The car is an EV2, that's one of those nine colors. So why isn't the grill color keyed to the car? Why did we opt to go with this? So if you go back into history and you look at some of our footage, you'll see where I actually interviewed the second owner of this car. He remembered it being an Argent grill. There is a reason that this grill was Argent on that car when it left the assembly line. There was a strike at the plant in Ontario, Canada that made these grills. There was a lack of grills going on in 1971. The other thing is there was a truck wreck in 1971 with a truck hauling a load of color key grills to the manufacturer so that they could put them on the car. So what does Plymouth do when the company that makes them is on strike and the truck hauling hundreds of them is wrecked? Are they gonna quit building the 71 Plymouth Cuda? No. They're gonna take the grills they do have and they're gonna put them in the cars. So hopefully that puts everything to rest. All right, let's take a look at the rest of the car. Let's look at the back of the car. It's funny on these deck lids because we do end up with a bit of an arc in the middle and I just have not figured out how to get rid of that. Some of the factory ones did it too, but you can see it's got a little bit of an arch to it. The gap's a little tighter down here. Uh, one thing is in 71, they went to a single torsion bar deck lid spring instead of double torsion bars. So the other thing is when you pop that key, this thing will kind of crank up on one side, but when it goes down, it, it looks like it's supposed to. The Organisol black on the back looks good. Not seeing any shiny spots. It has the same sheen that it should have. Back then, they didn't make this uh, by Plymouth Emblem. So this is an original one that I uh, bought from Tony's Mopar Parts and cleaned up, and it still looks great. Doesn't look brand new, but it looks great. This is brand new from Classic. New tail light chrome bezels, fantastic, still look good. Bumpers look good. These are uh, AMD rechromes. Tips look good. They actually still fit. A lot of times you get these cars back or see them at a car show and they'll move around on you. You'll The exhaust will settle or something. You'll have an exhaust tip that doesn't quite fit the opening. But those look pretty good. I might raise this one up just a hair. It may have got a little bit more gap in it. Here you can see I can put a finger in it. Over here, barely. But really, really proud of how this thing looks. That guy is gonna be so thrilled. So thrilled. Now, talk about the elephant in the room, the rear spoiler. That is a correct 71 Goal, G-U-L-L, -L, Goal Wing, where in 70 they called it a Go Wing. Go Wing turns down on the ends and slopes back. This one, kind of like a Goal Wing, just tapers down and drifts back. It is not coded for that. The owner that just bought the car always wanted one on his Cuda. He bought our 70 Cuda, the EV2 Tour Red car. It has a spoiler on it. He wanted this one to have one to go along with it. The car looks great. I don't see any rash on it whatsoever anywhere. 
I could lie and say it looks like it just got hand waxed. I can see wash scratches in the paint, but that'll just polish and wax and look absolutely like brand new. That's lip service. It's my show, 14 years, right? 14 years, I can do what I want. I beat Will down over the years. I would like to build him up right now. I'm gonna build him up right now in front of 82 million people watching live on Graveyard Cars. Well, not million, <laughs> thousand or hundred. Oh, Willie, little Willie, Willie down. Paint car. Getting ready to paint. You know, you're focused on what you have going on in the booth and really nothing else at that time. So when Mark comes to grab you to go look at something, it's not like a compliment. It's not good. I know, I know, I know you're busy. My management skills are a little bit different than other people's. I believe very much in building people up. Make them feel that they can do anything. You're an idiot. <laughs> that. What? It's, it's like a, a blacksmith that's working with steel, okay? Once that has been heated up and cooled down, it's stronger than ever. So build them up, build them up. That's the name of the game. 71 Cuda EV2 Tour Red. Recognize it? Yeah, I did it. Hmm, I did it. That's good. <clears throat> we need to talk about it. Is there a problem? However, in fairness, a blacksmith will oftentimes beat the metal down to a pulp where there's nothing left of it. And I think that's an important part of the skill sets too. Build them up, but be sure to beat them down. Beat them down to nothing. Make them question their very existence. Then build them up. Yeah, there's a problem. There's a real problem. This car looks great. For real? And what happens over a period of time is they become tempered, if I can use that word. No, give me a Dude. gun. Give me a gun. So about six years ago, I think we laid the paint out on this. Yes, I did. Yeah. Well, we did collectively. And the, and the reason I say that collectively is because it's a team. I noticed that you wouldn't take I get of, it now. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? No, I'm not taking You're saying credit. it's a good job because we did it. Oh. It's a good job because I give you a lot of crap. I ride you like mm -hmm. a mule. I know that you like doing things like occasionally accidentally running the paint. I've got you out of that. You like to kill bugs. I got you out of that. I can't control it. Nobody can control it. Is a this bug. the car that had the fly, the dead fly in it? Oh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Okay. What have you done? I, I, it wasn't my fault. What have you done? <laughs> Leave him You've alone. killed the fly. Oh, All right, we're good. That looks pretty good. Yeah, you can't see it. No. Like it never happened. That's right, it never happened. You're the bug man. I'm the ice man, you're the bug man. Right? Inside a paint booth, I kind of like to call it like a clean zone. In fact, you know what I'm going to call it? I'm going to call it the no-fly zone. This is a compliment. I so want to tell that's you a weird what a way phenomenal, to get to a compliment. Look, at, look at the shine. No, the car looks great. If you do a car, if you restore a car properly and you do the paint work properly, like this, and you use the quality materials like we do here, yes. you can come see this car 50 years from now. I promise you, 50 years, you'll be dead, I'll be dead. Well, Will will be dead. I don't know. I'm 58, I could live to be 108, my grandma was. Granny Russell, not the point. You could live for a long time and this car will always look like that. That is a hand wax away from looking like it was the day we did the car. It looks really good. Look at the shine on the door. Notice how they match. I force you to do it on a metallic color. You gotta do the whole car at one time, I tell you. You say no, the old man's wrong. Like in A Few Good Men. No, I think you're getting confused, but it's okay. I did understand. you panel paint this car? Yeah. Did you? Yeah. I find that very difficult to believe. Look. I've been painting a long time. Now I know what matches and what doesn't. And the odds that you're going to panel paint a metallic, a light orange like that, metallic, and Will paints great, but I'm a great painter. <laughs> well, my, my congratulations because it matches very, very nice. Thank you. All of it, the matte black. Now, do you remember anything about yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, Mark gives you a compliment. Man, there's, whew. That's the main thing I want to just say is what a phenomenal job you did. And you're welcome for the guidance. See, it's, you, you I know. mean, I, I appreciate your compliments. You know. But that. they always come with something else. It can't just be, Will, hey, you knocked this car out. 
there's got to be that side thing. There's got to be that extra. It's not just, hey, well, you did good. You did good, but You're I give you materials. I, I coddle you. I ride you. There's a level of truth in all of that, but that's not what this is about. This is about the mother thumping car with the mother thumping paint. That's Sam Jackson. I got to learn that Bible one from Pulp Fiction. That's pretty good. And he cast down upon him his wrath. Yeah, I got to work on that. I just wanted you to know that I am proud that you have come as far as you have and you do a great job for me. Just remember that when I come in there and I say something isn't right, it's not because I'm picking on you. It's because I want it to look like this 50 years later. Fair enough. I appreciate it. It's not even help. I'm in there trying to paint a car. He comes out. Chip Kelly was a big thing back then with his billboards. He was ahead of his time. And then Mark starts doing it. He was, he was the head coach for the Ducks, and he came up with this thing where he'd have pictures on a board, and they'd hold them up so the quarterback could see them. And each one of those pictures meant something. It was a code for something. So rather than holding up one zero and saying, okay, do code 10, whatever, uh, he had that. I took things just randomly. I don't know. I don't see why everybody got so offended and some of it got edited where you couldn't even show it on TV. Pictures, random pictures. I just typed in picture and it was a shot of, of uh, deliverance, all right? But that didn't mean there was no underlying message. Like if you didn't do something right in there, it was gonna be a deliverance situation. So you think when you're spraying a car, then you look out the window and he's got a billboard with a picture of deliverance on it as an intimidation factor. I get what you're doing, but I don't need your, you know, your billboard to tell me. Go back to writing checks or quoting movies. If you look at it like that, it probably does look like a lot of those things had hidden meanings. But honestly, they, those were 100% random. Nick, this is where you do the five Pinocchios. <laughs> what are you doing? Did this help? It's not helpful like a football coach at all. There, none of it's helpful. Willie, one more thing. Hang on. What? Remember how we had problems on the deck lid and we had to respray it? Look at the match. No. Look at the shine. Shine's the same. The depth, the character, the hue, the opacity, everything is exactly the same on the deck lid as it is on the Dutchman right. panel. I know. That's why you paid me what you do. Yeah. Well, I don't know about all that, but I'm just trying to tell you that you did a good job on it. Right. So. Yeah. Your job depends on that CUDA coming out good. <laughs> Sorry? I think every good manager knows that one of the most important things is to make sure that the employee knows their job is always on the line. Make sure that you rob at least a half hour of sleep a night from that person wondering, will I have a job? That's management skills. I, I just want to come to work, paint cars, make Mark a bunch of money, because then I make a bunch of money, and go home. No, I'm just saying I wish you the very best of luck. Thank there. you. Beth. But look at, look at here, now you got the quarter, this is what I mean, you can go around this car a hundred times. The quarter panel matches the door, the same hue, same shade, the same opacity, the same shine. Obviously, he's got to get that car painted, so. In a previous season of Graveyard Cars, we restored this stunning 1972 Charger Rally. True or false, the engine in that Charger Rally is a 440 Magnum. If you think you know the answer, remember, stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. All right, folks, how did we do on that one? True or false, the engine in our 1972 Dodge Charger Rally was a 440 Magnum. If you said false, very good, you are watching the show, good job. This car was a factory G code 318. It also featured air conditioning, an automatic transmission. It was a full rally package car. In addition to that, this car featured the blackout hood, rally doors, transverse black stripe, black canopy top, and white interior. Is that seatbelt gonna go around your pork? No. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's tight, huh? Alyssa right now is pregnant, so she is having her third girl, it looks like. 
which is okay. You know, I'm, I'm sure one of them will be a car gal. I have, I have no doubt about it. So she's a little bit pregnant and wasn't sure she wanted to be on camera, but I think she looked adorable. When we started Graveyard Cars almost a decade ago, Emma had just been born, Alyssa's oldest daughter. My number one, I love her. And so I thought, how nice would it be, since this is the last time we're gonna see the car, most likely, right? I don't fly, I don't play that. So I'm not gonna go to Switzerland to check it out. So I wanted to share the last drive with my daughter and my best friend, Royal. This is the car that started everything, and these are two people that are very near and dear to me, and I wanted to spend some time with them. Chris excited? Yeah. Yeah. He is. Have you named her? We like the name Capri, but we haven't. <laughs> are you not familiar with the Mercury Capri? No, oh, no, no. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend oh, it. Oh, no. I know there's a lot of Capris out there right now. There's that Juice Capri, Capri Sun, or whatever it is. It's going to be ugly. But it's all based on the Mercury Capri, which is a sad, sad, sad thing. I <laughs> got it. They made it in the show. This is a private conversation. <laughs> I'll call her Mercury then. That'll be her nickname. Oh, great. Poor girl. That's just how my dad is. Um, it doesn't matter what we're doing. We could be riding quads, we could be driving to the gas station, going to lunch, everything comes back to cars. Now this is interesting. My, my beef with the name is this. I worked at a Lincoln Mercury garage in Eugene. My old buddy, Len Lucas in Central Lincoln Mercury. I started as a lube guy, a lube technician. I worked my way up to service manager. And at the time, I believe I was 22 years old. I was the youngest service manager in the country, so. Mercury Caprice was the answer to the Ford Mustang. It was the first five liter Capri. So you heard of a 5.0 Mustang. Well, this was the five liter front engine rear wheel drive. First time that had been back, that combination in many years. And it was considerably worthless, gutless. It wouldn't get out of its own way. You couldn't shift fast enough. I don't know what all that was about. I was driving a Pacer with a 232.6 in it that would blow its doors off. Worthless. Don't name your kid Capri. No, I'm not naming my kid after a juice box or a crappy car. I don't care what my dad thinks about the names I choose for my kids because it doesn't matter. He's gonna come up with a screwed up nickname for them anyways. So Chris and I just choose what we like and we love the name Capri. It's actually an island off of Italy. It's a beautiful place. Oh, go to <laughs> initials. Uh, Ford made a little EXP. So you we, we call her EXP. It. That was a cute little car. So I just wanted you to get in the car and go okay. for a ride with me. This is the one that started it all. I thought it would be kind of fun. Now they got another baby. Your first baby wasn't even born when we started this car. I know. <laughs> I was back in high school. Yeah. And you were dragging me out to the shoots when we were un was just buried. Yeah, is so that we had to Did you come out there? Yeah. The night shoots That's out there. That's funny. Yeah. One of the craziest ideas I've ever had for graveyard cars was with this vehicle. I wanted to do a real live resurrection of the car. Like, yeah, I'm a big movie fan of the old Frankenstein Dracula. I remember Dr. Frankenstein dug up the grave and brought the monster out. I wanted to have something like that. So we physically buried that car out at uh, Chip's place, uh, the victim out in Marcola. And it was in a real live grave that was six feet deep. And not knowing any better, we took all the dirt that came out of it and put it on top of the car. We ran a chain down into the pit and we welded some skis on the bottom of the car. We put a wooden ramp in there. So theoretically, we just pull that thing out when the time came. Didn't work out so well because the dirt weighed 20 tons. There's a little video on YouTube right now, if you go over there, that shows the behind the scenes of that car when it was buried and how much trouble we had getting it out. Ultimately, we were able to get it out and set it right there on the ground and move forward with the rest of the restoration. Well, it still drives nice, though. Okay, so why did we rebuy this car back? What happened? Okay, so we sold this car. Originally, it was my friend in Canada. I had a client who I was doing some cars for that lived in Canada. He had reached out to me, and this goes back to around 07, 06, 07. Said he would love to find a real V-code four-speed D2171 Cuda. Well, at the time, this was before the big crash, that market was on fire. So a done nice car was three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000, which he didn't want to wrap that kind of money up into it. He wanted one that he could uh, buy as a project and pay me to restore. So I immediately went on the hunt for one. It took over a year before I stumbled across this car. This car was a real V-code car, D21 Hemi Orange. It also was a shaker hood car. 
So we ended up finding this car right here in Oregon. It was a friend of mine down in Medford had the car. The car was wrecked back in 1981 and it was left to be picked apart. So everything good was taken off of it. So we bought the car for 50 grand. Everything was in a manure trailer no, I that remember. went with the trailer. I remember when you pulled it up into the shop and it was literally crumpled. Crumpled up into a little and ball. And you were so excited to show everybody. So when my dad brought the Phantom on the back of the tow truck, it really didn't even need a tow truck. It just came in, it came in a box. I just thought, wow, thank you. That's awesome. That's what my college tuition went towards. Um, but my dad was so excited about it. Neither my mom or I could understand where that was coming from. I remember mom's reaction. $50,000 $50,000 and it all fit in the back of a 4 by 8 manure trailer. No one was happy for you. Nobody was happy. Nobody was upset. They're like, why'd you do this? Anywho, <laughs> we floated this thing on a Mopar only board, thread board and said, hey, you guys heard about the 71 Cuda that was 446 barrel four speed that was buried after it was wrecked in 1981. People start right now, BS, you're a liar, you're a fat mouth, there's no way that happened. So yeah, that's really what started it all. Aaron came over and he laughed, cracked up big time. I, I do it all the time. <laughs> Uh, watching me and the guys work on the car, making the poles on it, and he said, you guys should have your own show. He goes, watch American Chopper, you'll see what I'm talking about. So I, I bought the first two seasons on disc of American Chopper. Oh, I remember this. You made us sit through all that. And I studied it, yep, and I decided I'm gonna make my own show, Graveyard Cars, and the rest is history. We would not be here if my guy in Canada had not bought this car, because mm -hmm. I'd have never had Aaron say, we should do a show. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for that. Thank you, Aaron Smith. You know, Aaron's been with me a long time, so I got to give props to him. He's been here as long as the car has been. He's still upstairs. He's our executive producer. What in the hell's going on there? Why is there just a huge ceramic pig? It always reminds me of the Night Slasher from Cobra. Remember him? I don't. Oh, yeah. He was the guy at the end called everybody pig. Oh, my God. We're the new revolution, aren't we, pig? He stopped evolving around 1980 or maybe 1989. He doesn't watch anything new. He never has. I've bought him tons of new movies. I don't understand it. Does that happen to everybody? Am I going to just stop evolving? How do you, how, when you watch a movie, do you remember every freaking line? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> anyway, there you go. The big well, enchilada. I'm glad the I one got one two punch. Yeah. I'm glad I got one last ride in her before she's gone. In case gone any of you me. haters out there are wondering about my daughter, this may be the first time you see her this season. She's pregnant. She's having a. Girl. Distant fruit of my loin, a, uh, a generational seed. So I start the seed, then I just carry it on through the generations. Yeah, literally not, and I when mean, they have a, a baby, what? that'll be my seed going on there. How do we get out of this thing? You know, when the car is on its way out of the country and I'll probably never see it again, I was feeling a bit nostalgic. So I called up old uh, chromium diomside, cue ball Morton, skin cap head, eight ball in the corner pocket. Me and Rolo cruising Ooh. the Phantom Cuda. Out on the road again. Uh, road is Willie Nelson ever gonna die? No. I had him come over and go for a ride with me in the car and it was really fun. We could just drive around, remember some of the things about the car that stood out in his mind, and I thought it was a really great opportunity to hang out with my buddy Royal. Feel that? You like that? I like that. Reminds me of the old days when we were cruising around. <laughs> yeah, tap on that gas. Did it go up? It, it, it did a little bit. <laughs> when Mark and I had our first cars, if you could afford to buy gas, you were doing good. He, he liked to tap on his gas gauge, thinking it would give him more gas. I don't know. Well, what's your favorite memory of this old car? My favorite memory of the Phantom Cuda, when Mark said he was going to do a TV show, and we pulled it in there and started making the pulls on it early on, you know, to see something as banged up as that was and twisted to come out just with what we did that first day. Um, that was exciting. And then the other, my other favorite was getting to drive it after it was all put together, or right in it, I guess. I don't remember driving it. Mark says I did, but I don't remember. Didn't you go out with us? to, where was it? Monroe. Uh, it was really fun going back to uh, the original crash site of the 
Phantom Cuda. Got to see, you know, kind of lay out where it had happened, how it had happened. And because of the way it was twisted, it was hard to understand, you know, without seeing the scene as to how that could have happened. We found the actual corner, and the guy had said that they actually paid that blacktop like two years earlier. Otherwise, the gouges in the concrete were still there from when this car flipped. Oh, really? That was really interesting. Yeah, that was a really interesting field trip. After we checked out the crash site, we um, actually got a hold of the guy that owned the car. Mark was talking to him, and he guided us up to his dad's place um, up out of Monroe. I don't know, there must have been 100 cars from the 40s all the way till the present. And he had driven every one of those and parked them there. So that was really cool to hear his stories behind those cars. With the CUDA, we were able to trace it back to 1973. We talked to the owner who owned it in 73, and at that time, it had a 318 in it. It did not have the 446 bro. It was already gone. He had bought it from a gentleman out in Springfield. It was setting up on blocks, no engine in it, but the transmission was in it. No interior in it for whatever reason. Nobody knows why. Mark found the power steering pump off the small block and the uh, lower core support for it. Been sitting there for 30 years. But we were able to trace that car back to when it was only two years old. And I think that had we continued to dig, we might have been able to find the original owner. Driving around a town that you grew up in with your best friend in a car that they said couldn't be restored, like the old commercial says, is priceless. To me, it's a moment in time that I will always be able to cherish and be able to tell the people that I love about as I get older and probably start to lose my mind and forget who the hell I am half the time. That story's sticking with me. We're driving all over Springfield in a car that they said could not be done. Sharing stories of the build, but also stories of our youth, the things that made Royal and I the friends that we are today. It means the most knowing I was able to restore the car, but I was able to do it with my friends. And we were able after that to share it with even more friends and family. But then ultimately, having graveyard cars as a platform to be able to share all of that and know that people in Switzerland, of all places, watch the show or fans of the show so much that they would buy this car so they could have a graveyard cars vehicle in their stable. So to think that I painted a car on television so recognizable that's in Switzerland now is actually just kind of a lot to wrap your mind around. A wonderful compliment to what we do. It's a wonderful compliment to the people who helped make me who I am today. Thanks, Rollo. Thanks for going for a road test, traveling down memory lane with us. <laughs> the show was based around this car, and I was there at day one. So to see this car be nothing, to being done, to being given to the customer, coming back for some touch-ups, be freshened up, to be sent off again. It's cool that I've been part of that process from start to finish. I do have to say thank you to everyone that helped us bring that car back to life. Because now that that's done, and now that it's going home to a new owner, the next chapter in its life begins now. <laughs>